You're 15 years old. You cannot lie to me. I will drag you down with this if you start lying with me. I need you to be 100% honest. Was Nick there? Yes. You sure? Who else is in the living room with you? Nick. Then when he got there, the lights were still on, and he said he fell asleep. I've been calling my parents all day, and then it's done, so. He hasn't talked to them since, like, six yesterday. Did you have a gun? No. Are you sure? Have you ever seen him carrying a real gun? No. Nah. Well, I don't want this to come back and bite you. Uh, How did you open the garage door? That was good. He pulls the car keys out of his jacket. Did you talk to your brothers at all? No. Nick told his little brother to keep the door unlocked for him to come in last night. We discovered his dad on the couch, like, bloody. His face was really pale. You don't want to start lying to me right now. You called home and talked to Greg at one point last night? I did. Because you will go to jail for the rest of your life. I think you had something to do with what happened tonight. The more you lie, the deeper it gets. There is no lesser punishment you're offering me if I come up with a reason. These are the words of a deranged teenage killer, challenging the detectives after slaying his entire family. This is the story of a deranged boy who ruthlessly shot his mum, dad and two younger brothers. Nicholas Wagner Browning, born in 1992, hails from the Baltimore suburb of Cockeysville, Maryland. His father John was an attorney and his mother Tamara was a homemaker. He had two younger brothers, 13-year-old Gregory and 11-year-old Benjamin. On February the 8th, 2008, when Nick Browning, his three friends, Ryan Fingles, Taylor Tewksbury and Alexander Smith arrived at his home, they immediately knew something was unusual. At first glance, the house looked like it had been burglarized, but later, they discovered that Nick's entire family was shot dead as they were sleeping in their beds. The possibility of a burglary was discarded with respect to the circumstantial evidence. Nick and his three friends were taken into custody, as they were the key witness and, to a great extent, the prime suspects. They were separated into three different interrogation rooms. Nick's three friends were considered crucial witnesses in this case, as Nick, for the majority of the day of the unfortunate event and the following day with his friends. Considering the brutality and immaturity of the murder, the interrogation was analyzed by licensed attorneys and clinical psychologists. All the witnesses and suspects being juveniles, the detectives had to be careful to make sure they understood their rights. It's no wonder the teenagers would be nervous and frightened as it was a mass murder case. So the cops interacted very casually with the four boys to create a rapport with them from the beginning. They tried to come across as friendly, so they might be less inclined to lie. Yeah. After gathering basic information from the boys, detectives learned that the four boys were sleeping over at Ryan's house that night. You guys spent the entire evening together yesterday? Yes. The detective sat with Nick very closely when compared to the others, wherein he was intentionally invading his personal space to make him focus on him. It is a psychological approach because it is more difficult to lie to someone who's inches from your face looking directly at you. Ryan explains that Nick temporarily left the sleepover for a few hours as he planned to sneak home to get the car from his house, just a few miles away from Ryan's house. Nick had plans to drive back and take the boys for a ride, but it didn't happen because the lights were still on when he got there, so he just sat in the car and fell asleep. However, the detectives could identify that the teen's story was a cooked up one and seemed illogical. If any intruder had invaded the house, they could have robbed as well, and they will never let the lights on. The interrogation session with Nick Browning was creepy from the beginning itself. He showed no emotions or frustrations. It was shocking to learn how casually Nick talked about his parents and brothers, given that he just found them dead. And I went upstairs the first of my mother and my two brothers. I saw them. Nick intentionally gave an erroneous timeline of events so that it doesn't line up with him being at the house when his family was killed. The officers continued questioning him about the gun locker in the house in the basement. Gun locker in the house? In the base basement. What kind of guns your dad have? Two pistol, a 40 caliber. 9mm. Nick was outright giving explicit details of the type of guns that his father had. With this question and his answer, police established that Nick knew enough about the gun locker. So it gives hints that Nick could potentially use the guns inside it and him being the shooter gains probability. Nick Browning was a smart student, as his friends affirm, but his addiction to drinking doesn't typically align with the profile of a good student. But emotional stress can often throw children to seek ways to cope with that excess pressure. Many such students have insane parents who set excessively high expectations for their kids. 
Nick's friend Alex pointed out a troubled relationship between Nick and his dad due to his bad habits. The officers tried to take down Nick by telling him that his friends had ratted him out and that they had received information about his past mistakes. When asked about this, Nick seemed mature and well composed in his answers. You said you had a good relationship with your dad. Was he hard on you at all or anything like that? I mean, yeah, we've had our issues, but okay. He told that though his parents used to warn him to stay away from alcohol and other stuff, they never crossed the limits to torture him or restrict him from enjoying his life. Nick was moving wisely, making every effort to avoid speculation of him committing the murder. He was more than happy to share with the cops his encounters with his parents while he was caught drinking and roaming outside. He presented the rapport with his family so beautifully that it never felt like he had a grudge towards any of them for interfering in his life. I love my family. They provide me with everything I want. They're still there. I love them. Visibly, there was no reason for him to kill his family, and that's what confused the detectives. Nick also demanded food and water during the breaks. It was extremely bizarre to find someone eating and drinking in peace who had just lost his entire family in the worst way. The camera footage in the interrogation room showed that when Nick was left alone, he relaxed and slept while keeping his legs over the officer's chair. When asked why he is impassive about losing his dear ones, he questioned, so I don't show emotion that condemns me? The detectives decided to tighten the questioning pattern and begin listing the evidence that zeroes out the possibility of burglary in the house. There's no other explanation. Nobody broke into this house. It was you. You left your friends. They also pointed out that a set of keys were discovered on his bed. Nick faced all these allegations with ease. He argued that the chance of burglary could not be ruled out only because something expensive was not robbed. He also mentioned that more than two sets of keys are in the house, and finding one on his bed is not unusual. The high school student stood emotionless, and he was confident that a jury would believe his story that burglars were responsible for the killings. Then the cops accused him of killing his parents to claim the insured amount, and scared of sharing it, he killed his brothers. Nick also denied this story, saying why should he kill his parents for money, as he will eventually inherit their properties, which is enough and to spare for him to lead a luxurious life. There's no reason for me to kill them. They provide me with everything I want. But they were stripped. The detectives found no other way to make Nick confess and plead guilty. At last, they asked him directly to explain the reason for slaying his family. Nick frankly asked the officers what was the point of giving a reason. Nick realized that he will be ultimately sent to jail whether or not he reveals the motive. Finally, the detective applies the re-technique of mitigating circumstances or alternatives. The officer explained that people do things for reasons, sometimes impacting outcomes. This may prompt the suspect to confess and feel less judged. We talk to people every day who love their wives, love their children, love their babies, love their friends, and they sit right where you're sitting. But things happen, we're human beings, things upset people. He will also make the suspect believe that there will be room for justification for his actions. The officers also asked Nick whether he wanted to be known as a cold-blooded killer or a killer made out of the situation. They were expecting Nick to hold on to the less morally reprehensive alternative and explain the situations that led him to commit the mass murder. The idea worked out, and after much contemplation, Nick confessed. Nick covered his face almost the entire time he explained the killing spree. He was very mad at me that night. I saw him sitting on the couch. The TV was on. I knew that the gun was out on the workshop bench. I went between putting the gun up to his head and pulling it back, down and up. I'm not sure if I meant to pull the trigger. It just went off. I realized I just couldn't walk away from that. And then I shot my mum. No one was there to say anything that my story would go because I was the only one. Nick might have had antisocial personality disorder. Otherwise, he could have made this decision purely based on his desire to satisfy his immediate needs. Maybe he desperately wanted freedom to be an independent adult, so he decided to eliminate the hurdles in his way. Individuals with antisocial personality disorder will not react to this intervention from parents as a typical team would, like arguing, rebelling, sneaking out, maybe defying their parents. Nick was sentenced to four life terms for killing his parents and younger brothers. What do you think about Nick who committed the quadruple homicide? Do you think traumatic parenting could have made him a psychopath? Or is he born with killer instincts? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and subscribe to our channel to unveil more terrifying reactions in the courtroom. Until next time, goodbye.